So we want to bring you a, a message today in a series that we're calling, Let's Grow Already. Here's, here's the reality, okay? The number of people that attend this church right now, if they all showed up at once, there would not be enough room for them. But thankfully, somebody has some sort of communication system happening where we're all rotating. And every week, there just happens to be enough room for everybody to come at once. It's honestly, it's a beautiful thing because lives are being changed. But the, rea- the, the, the exciting reality is there's not enough room to contain everybody. And so many lives are changing, but we got to see more traction because people are slipping through the cracks. Today, we're going to bring you a message helping you to understand how we are stronger together. Can you say that with me? Stronger together. And a really good way for us to bring this message to light is to uh, show you or share with you a parable that Jesus taught. And this is Luke's account, Luke chapter eight. And we're going to start in verse four. But before I read this, I I just want to um, encourage you to be mindful because I think we take it for granted when we get into God's word, especially when we read these passages where Jesus is speaking. You know, Jesus may not be here in the flesh with us today right now, but how cool is it that he left us these writings, these accounts of him being quoted, things that he spoke and taught on the hillside to the multitudes and things that he taught his disciples directly. You know, how cool is it? Because today we can stand in God's house and we can hear Jesus' words being spoken directly to us. Isn't that cool? Amen. So as we hear these words being spoken, I want you just to know that God knew you before you were ever even born. You know, he formed you in your mother's womb. He was thinking about you when he was teaching this on the hillside. And so I want you just to take it to heart and realize Jesus is speaking to you. In verse four, it says, one day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seed fell on the fertile soil. Say fertile soil. This seed grew and it produced a what? A crop. That's what's most important is that your seed produces a crop. And all the farmers in the house said, Amen. Amen. And this crop that it produced was huge. It was massive. It was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear. And he wasn't just talking to those on the hillside. He was talking to those of us that would be sitting in this room more than 2,000 years after he preached it on the hillside. That's you and that's me. He says, hear what I'm about to tell you. Have ears to hear, listen and understand. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. You may be asking what this parable means. He explains in verse 11, he says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. Say God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, then they, what? They fall away when they face temptation. Verse 14 says, the seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And as pastors, we see it continually week in and week out. People with so much hope, so much potential. They've got so much momentum going. They're on fire. And before you know it, they fade away. And as pastors, you want to help them. You want to do it for them, but you can't, right? We, as believers, we have to get it and we have to run with it. And we got to get grounded. We got to get rooted. We got to connect and we have to grow in the house of God. This reminds me of my walk with God. If you haven't heard my story, this is a very, very short version. But basically, what happened is when I was 12 years old, uh, I had been in church, um, you know, 
off and on throughout my whole childhood. But when I was 12, there was an evangelist at our church and he was teaching this powerful series on the end times, believe it or not. And man, it was so compelling and God had just been dealing with my heart all week. And it was a Friday. I remember uh, like it was yesterday. And I remember thinking at school that day, when I go tonight, I'm going to, I'm going to go up front and I'm going to give my life to Jesus when he opens up the altar. And I did when he opened it up, man, I, as soon as my, I was sitting right about uh, where Keelan's sitting right here. And I, I remember I stepped out and as soon as I got up and put my foot on the carpet, I just started bawling my eyes out. And I bawled all the way down to the altar and I just buried my face in the steps. I was 12 years old. But from the time I was 12 to 20, I can relate to this passage where it says that the people, you know, all too quickly, the message was crowded out by what? The cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. I never matured or developed into who God wanted me to be from the time I was 12 to 20 because I was so distracted by what I thought would pay out. All the things that brought me pleasure, all the things that brought me what I thought was happiness, from girls to money, everything that I wanted, I went after, and everything I went after, I got a hold of, only to find out when it was all said and done that I was empty and miserable. So I learned the hard way that those pleasures of life, the riches and the things that draw us away to entice us, those things don't pay off. I realized that those things I was chasing was like that mechanical rabbit on the racetrack and it was just going around and around. I was chasing it, exhausting myself almost to my own death. And it would have led to death if I would have kept chasing those things. I found myself so exhausted and so empty, I realized that there was no payout, that the rabbit was fake. It was fake. So I, I remembered when I was 12, I remembered that there is a God in heaven who loved me, who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. I remembered that there was a Jesus that said he would give me a hope and he had plans for me and a future for me. And I said, I'm ready to try that plan. And you know what I did? I started going to church. I wasn't in church. In fact, I'll get a little real and honest with you because some of you might need to hear this. I was living with a girl that I wasn't married to and I was completely miserable because I was living in sin. And so I'm not, you're not gonna find God's purpose living in sin, you're just not. When you have sin in your life, sin separates. You can't hear God, you can't have relationship with God because sin separates. So I knew that I had to get out of that environment. So, so when you wanna really pursue your purpose, and this is what I did, I had to get radical. So I dropped her like a bad habit. I moved out of the house. I literally did a survey of all the friends in my life, all the people in my life, that I had surrounded myself with and asked myself, are they pushing me towards Christ or are they pulling me away? And if I, if, I, if I knew in my heart that they were not pushing me towards Christ, I severed my relationship with them. Yeah. And then I got in church and I started going to church every single time the doors were open to the point to where the senior citizen small group was saying, why are you here? I'm like, I just got to get this together. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll hold the door. I'll do whatever I need to do. I just need to be around godly people because I've chased that, that, that mechanical rabbit and the rabbit never paid it. Did you know the rabbit was fake? It's not even real. Did you even know that? And I know I need to be here. I'm realizing that greatness is contagious. So I got to get around greatness and greatness is godly people who love the Lord, who love his word, who love his house, who love to worship him, who love to talk about him and live their life for him. People who even fall down from time to time, but they're man enough or woman enough to get up and knock the dust off their knees and say, I'm going to try it again and again and again and again. We're talking about a perfect church for imperfect people. I realized that was the payoff. And so that's what I did. I got connected with the body of Christ. And I began to realize the people I hang out with, the people that are in my group, that's what really matters because they're gonna make me who God wants me to be. And I'm never gonna truly be happy. My life is never gonna make sense until I get this. And so that's what I did. I got involved, I got connected, I started growing and my life was never the same again. You know, at Mountain Movers, we planted this church almost 16 years ago and when we did, 
Brad and I as pastors made a decision that we wouldn't open the doors without sharing the gospel. There wouldn't be an event we did. There wouldn't be any kind of service that we put on. We would always share the gospel. And if you've been here any length of time, you know that whether it's a funeral, I mean, we almost work it into weddings, but don't be scared. I mean, not always, but the fact is if you give us a mic, we're going to share the gospel and we're going to give somebody an opportunity to surrender their life to Jesus because that's all that really matters in this world. And you know, as this church began to grow, our front doors were wide open and we constantly were like, go invite your friends, go invite your friends. Can I tell you how good you are at inviting your friends? Do you know at MMC, we see an average of 24 brand new people every single week every week all year long let me put that into perspective real quick one time I was at a conference and we were just trying to gauge how many newcomers should we see coming through the doors What's we had a, no idea what we was had good. no idea what a healthy number was and so I asked these you know this the pastor he was oh he wasn't the lead pastor but he was over uh, like first impressions so basically just like helping people to get acclimated to the church family making them feel like family and um, I said Will you mind just telling me how many, on average, how many newcomers do you see come through the doors every week? And he said about 9 to 12. Well, the thing was, his church was about 1,500 people, 9 to 12. And I figured, okay, and I asked others, and that seemed to be about the average, 9 to 12 people for a church of 1,500. Yeah. So I'm telling you, our numbers of people that are coming through the doors are absolutely insane. It's three times what a mega church in Dallas is seeing. And we, if you haven't noticed, are in the middle of flipping nowhere. And there are <laughs> buffalo across the road. Road. So man cannot be glorified in any of that. That cannot be Come Brad and Misty or any pastor on right. staff at this church. That has to be Jesus. Jesus. You can give him Amen. some praise. That's God. That's not man. And it's because you're inviting your friends and you're praying over them and you're meeting people in town and you're saying, hey, come out to the middle of nowhere. This year, guys, we've seen 1,215 brand new VIPs on campus this year alone, not even counting all of our online family, which we absolutely love. And we know that there's many more watching online that we don't even realize. But here's what I want you to understand with that. The parable that we just read that Jesus taught, he taught us it's not just about scattering seed. See, we're all about planting the seed. Every time we get together, we're going to plant the seed. We're going to share the gospel because that is the hope of this world. But it's not just enough to scatter seed. Jesus said, we have to make disciples. And there's a difference between scattering seed and making a disciple. You say, well, what is a disciple? I mean, I've heard that word tossed around in the church. What's a disciple? A disciple is a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Think about that. Fully devoted. Not just someone who says, I believe in God. Not just someone who buys the Christian t-shirt. Not just someone who says, I prayed a prayer once when I was 12, but it really never affected my life. It doesn't affect my daily decision making. We're talking about people who are fully surrendered. That's what Jesus gave his life for. As pastors, what we're seeing, guys, is we're seeing in the droves, new people coming in and we love that. It is our heart and our passion and our mission to make every single person who walks onto this campus feel at home and like they're a part of our family. But listen, we don't want you to just feel a part of the family. We want you to be a part of our family. It is only when you become a part of the family do you really see your life changed. The reason Brad's life changed, and honestly, we joke all the time because we didn't meet until college. And he says, I wish we would have met in high school. I said, I would have never, I would have never even dated you. I wouldn't have even looked at you. Like there's no way God knew. And I wouldn't have deserved you. Well, it didn't matter at that, but we were two totally different people. So also realize God's timing and all that, all you single people, okay? Maybe whoever God's preparing for you doesn't even know him yet, and he's got to work on them a little mm -hmm. bit, so you need to be a little bit more patient. But the fact is, we are called as a church to make disciples, not just scatter that seed. And that's why around here, we have midweek. I want to just give you a quick illustration. We've done this so many times, but... The church is made up of three types of people, and we're going to illustrate them with three chairs this morning. You got chair number one. This is the person who is far from God. 
And you might be here today and you're just checking us out. Maybe you lost a bet last night. And so you're here because somebody betted you, right? And you're just checking it out. You're really not sure about this whole Jesus thing. You're not surrendered and that's okay. Maybe you're watching us right now and you just want to see what the hype is all about. I want to tell you, you're always welcome. We want to be here as you're searching. We want to surround you and love you as you're trying to figure this out. That's chair one. But then you got chair two. And chair two are baby believers. These are people who they've checked it out for a while and they have realized this thing's real. God is real. Jesus loves me. And I really want to surrender my life. And so you make that decision. You pray that prayer and you start on this new journey. Now, anybody who's raised a baby, you know that babies are messy. Do you agree? Never forget Brad had not been around children very much when we just back to back had four of them. Okay. And so he got acclimated real fast, but I used to have him like, Hey, feet AJ, feet tie up in the high chair. And he hated the messiness because he'd put it in their mouth and they'd spit it back out. And he was like, what's the point? This is exactly, this is exactly what you sounded like too. I'd be in the other room. He's like, what's the point? They're spitting it back out. And I'm like, Calm down. There's You're laughing because I know some of you guys are doing it. Like, dude, eat it. <laughs> and I'm like, Brad, they don't know. They're trying. They're trying to learn. And guess what? Guys, baby believers, some of you guys, you're right here in chair two. And we want to surround you because we know it's messy. We know you're going to fall down. We know you're going to make messes. We know you're going to struggle as you're trying to get grounded. All right? But the goal is not to stay a baby. Okay? The goal is not to stay on the bottle. Once we get past about 12 months, we're like, come on now, people. It's time. Time to cut that off. We need to be eating table food, right? Because we expect people to grow. Then you got chair three. And chair three are mature believers. These are those fully devoted followers of Jesus who the Bible says in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the Great Commission says that we're to make disciples who are obeying everything that Jesus taught. He says, go and make disciples and teach them to observe everything I commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Chair three is the goal, okay? The goal is not just to scatter some seeds and get people who are looking for Jesus. The goal is you meet Jesus and you don't just stay a baby. You don't just keep making messes, but we come alongside you and you grow and you develop. And once you get here in chair three, your heart begins to break for the chair one people. And your life begins to revolve around, I wanna help people to come to know Jesus. And man, I remember struggling. I remember being an addict. I remember the messes I made. I remember falling down. And I remember the people who came alongside of me and said, come on, dust yourself off. Get back up. Let's go again. Come on, get back up. Let's go again. God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances to infinity and beyond. I remember the people who picked me up and helped me come until I was a mature believer who could go and help someone do it again. Guys, this is what midweek is all about. Midweek is about bringing all types of people together in a smaller group. Our mission for midweek is so simple. We wanted to make it simple so you would remember it. And it's simply this. Connect and grow. Connect in deep, meaningful, godly relationships. Relationships is where it's at. And then grow in the word of God. Because when these small groups get get together, we talk about God's word. We pray God's word. We encourage each other. But here's the beauty of this picture. I remember one time in a small group, in in a life group, many years ago, almost in the beginning, and Brandy was leading it. And I remember her asking for prayer in the small group at the very, very end. And this guy raises his hand in the back and he says, "Uh, yeah, you can pray for me. I'm drunk. And... You know, her response was perfect because we are the perfect church for imperfect people. The response was this, as it should be. We're so glad you're here. So you could not have picked a better place to be tonight than with us. And so we're so glad you're here. Thank you. We're going to pray for you. And we pray for him. But what was really beautiful was after life group, I look out the door and I see about five men gathered around this guy, hands on their shoulder. They were praying for him. 
exchanging phone numbers. And they said, man, we're here from you, for you. And, and, and some of them had, you know, who are here now said, I, I remember what it was like sitting in, sitting in this chair. And I know what it's like to have alcohol and drug addictions. I know what it's like. And so you can do, listen, if God can do it in me, right, God can do it in you. And that's the power of small groups. For those of you that say, man, I'm chair, th- I don't need to be in a small group. Man, I've been serving God 50 years. Why do I need to be in a small group? Because they need you. They need you. You have something to contribute. You have something to give back. You have, you guys, every single season, we do these small groups, every single season, we hear stories and we hear life group leaders say, I don't know how these people ended up in the group, but God just drops people that need to be in the group because so-and-so has gone through everything that so-and-so is dealing with and they've just been helping each other the whole season. And it is God ordained and God appointed. I'm telling you, God uses this model of small groups. He created it and he gave us the plan and the word of God. And guess what? It works. And so, so here's the vision. The more of us that can get involved and get in a small group, get connected and grow. We're not only gonna see growth in our own lives, but we're gonna see growth in the local church that results in people making heaven their home. But I wanna show you a video real quick of the power of a group and what it can really mean if you get connected and you begin to grow. Watch this. Hi, I'm Sally Wilburn and in May, I established care with a new provider. And she had ordered just your regular female test, um, never had any issues before. Went in on May the 12th and had a mammogram. And the technician that was doing the mammogram told me that if everything came back good, then they would just upload the results to the portal. Um, If there was issues, I would get a phone call first. Um, I was cooking dinner on May the 18th. My phone went off and notified me that a new test result had been uploaded in the portal. So even though she had told me um, if it was uploaded that it would be normal, I went ahead and I looked at it and um, the mammogram actually came back not normal. Uh, It showed that there was a mass and it was a definite mass. The next morning I got a phone call from my provider's office um, to apologize first because those results should have never been uploaded to the portal without talking to me, Um, but they were and she informed me then that I was gonna have to go in for some extensive testing um, because they were pretty concerned about the mass and its location. June 5th, I went in and they did a mammogram. They were trying to see if I was gonna need to go and have a in-depth ultrasound done. Um, So they put me in a room with just a big clock on the wall and it was just quiet and it was ticking. They wouldn't let John come back. Um, So I did the only thing that I knew to do. Um, in Life Group, they teach us that you know you don't have to walk through life alone. So I reached out to some of my fellow Life Group um, and asked them just to pray, you know, and told John that you know it was still there. I seen it. Um, there were several images actually with it, um, all circled with all the measurements. And so everybody, you know, in the groups was texting me saying that they were praying and stuff. Well, the technician came back and said that I had to go and have the ultrasound. So as I'm walking across the hall, I'm still texting people, telling them please pray and believe that, you know, it's gonna be okay. Um, as the next technician was doing the ultrasound, she, I asked her where the, you know, the mass was and she actually showed me and um, she did the measurements and everything on it. And she did a few more shots of it and then all of a sudden in the same area, there was like a black hole. But me not being a radiologist or anything, I didn't have a clue what it was. Um, I just figured it was just a different angle. Um, She finished and she told me that she was going to go and go over everything with the doctor and just breathe and, you know, if everything came back good, then that was good. But if the doctor came in first, then that was bad news. It seemed like forever and I'm texting John as he's out in the waiting room and he's telling me it's okay, God's got us, it's going to be okay, you know, no matter what. And um, there was a knock on the door and it was the doctor. Um, at that time, I, I don't even know what to think, um, but she came in and she's like, I need you to go back to have the mammogram done again. And I asked her what, and so she repeated herself and I said, so it's that bad? And she kind of got agitated, it sounded like, and she's like, I just need you to go back over there. The technician starts doing the 
new pictures and the doctor probably about three or four shots in was like I just don't get it and I didn't say anything and they do some more and she says it again and then a couple more images and she says it a third time and finally I was like you don't get what and she said um, I have 27 images right there I have an ultrasound and now I have 13 images and there's nothing there I just don't get it um, and I sat there for a second and then I was like, well, I get it. And I said, that's what the power of prayer does and that's what my God can do. And she said, huh? And so I repeated myself and then I asked her to please unhook me for the machine. The technician is walking me out and she hands me the paper that said everything showed normal and that I didn't have to go back for another year. Um, at that time, I felt like I was probably gonna pass out and probably look like it. Everything uh, has, been cleared and the only explanation I have is that's the power of prayer. You know we all walk through different storms of life and you know um, there's been times that I never thought that I'd make it through and just the power of prayer and connecting with people that you go to church with that you know are believers. It was definitely you know my faith was good and then right before it kind of got shaky um, but then you know reaching out to those that believe and walk with me and everything uh, really helped keep me on the right path. What an incredible story. Give God a hand. You know, that really shows you the power in groups. Sally and John have been at the church, I'm not exactly sure how long, but they hadn't been here that long when they got connected. They didn't just sit here. You know, so many times people, our lives are busy and I'm right there with you, right? My voice sounds tired because it's been a busy three months. And the fact is we live, we live very full lives, but we choose what we put on our calendar. Would you all agree? We choose. And by default, we say, well, you know, I, I wish I could. But the fact is, if you wish you could, you would. Because the fact is we all control our own schedules. And as believers, it is God's plan for each of us that we would get rooted and grounded. <clears throat> and as pastors, it is our heart's cry that we would watch people literally step into the purpose for which they were created. I can't tell you how many conversations we have in our own home as we've raised our children through high school and now our kids are college and married and they're in that young adult life. And I remember being there and I've told my kids so many times, don't worry about what it looks like down the road. You worry about putting Jesus first right now. You get grounded because when you get grounded, you will learn to hear God's voice. And until you learn to hear God's voice, you're gonna miss it over and over and over and over and over again. And you're gonna chase all the wrong things. I wanna tell you the fastest way that you can get grounded is to get connected. And that's what midweek is for. That's why we have midweek. And guys, we don't just have groups with adults. Parents, you need to understand that from the moment your kids are in kids ministry, they also break down into smaller groups. I love hearing the stories of first graders in their group and them sharing their heart and their struggles. Realizing that when you come out on a midweek on a Wednesday night, there are people going to wrap your teenagers up. And let me tell you, having raised ours, when they would come into small groups and accelerate, accelerate leaders are telling them the same thing I'm telling them at home. But somehow when somebody else says that a light bulb goes off and you're like, well, at least you got it. You know what I mean? Forget mom and dad, but somebody else told you and you got it. Guys, you need to be connected in groups. That's how we grow our roots down deep. So we want to challenge you as we roll into a new season of groups. We realize schedules are full, schedules are busy, but we're going to challenge you right now to make midweek a priority. You say, oh, I live too far. That's fantastic because we have online groups. All you got to do is have a smartphone or a computer or a tablet. And I dare say every one of you have those. All right. And so it doesn't matter where you are. We've got daytime groups, nighttime groups. We've got Wednesday night for your whole family, but we're going to challenge you with this challenge this season, get in a group and be faithful. I can tell you right now, story after story after story of people who gave their life to Jesus and they went so fast from here to here. I mean, like lightning. And I can tell you why. 
because when the doors were open, they got their butt here. It was not a question as to where we will be on Wednesday night or where we will be on Sunday morning. We will be in the house of God. Whatever we are, whatever the house of God is doing, that's where we're going to be because they understood they needed to be planted and rooted and grounded. People whose lives were so messy, so many stories I could tell you, and now you wouldn't even recognize them. If they told you what their life used to look like, you wouldn't even believe them. But that's the power of getting rooted and grounded. So we challenge you. Parents, make that decision for your family. Be here. Get connected in this new midweek season. So let's make this challenge really clear. If you're not in a small group of some sort, we want you to get in one this season. And if you're already in one, then we want you to identify those that God has put around you here within the church family that are not connected to a group and encourage encourage and challenge them to get involved in a group as well because you realize this is a growth strategy, not just for each individual in the church that you would grow spiritually, but this church is going to grow numerically, which means more people make heaven their home. The more we get in these chairs, in the high chair, and we go from chair two to chair three, the more we, the more people we reach, the more people make heaven their home. That's what the church is all about. It's God's plan A. There is no plan B. People need hope. We are the church. We are the hope of the world. People need Jesus. And that's you and me getting involved, getting in groups.